Well, good morning and welcome to another episode of Unpublic with Citizen Stewart. Uh, today's a great day. It's not often that you get to interview one of your sheroes from long back. So today <laughs> is that day for me. Like I have a long list of guests that over like two to three years that I have not gotten to everybody that um, that I think uh, was played a real role in how I developed the way that I see the world when it comes to education as a person who was a lay person and a parent and just a pissed off parent with a problem mm -hmm. who eventually became an activist. At some point, I needed information to go beyond being an activist, but to also be become an informed activist, an activist who uh, was curious, intellectually curious about uh, the problems that we were trying to solve. Years ago, uh, when I was on a board, I used to get um, on every email list that I could possibly get on. And my email, this is, you know, <laughs> this is back to when email wasn't the primary way you got information, but my box would fill up with reports and graphs and, and um, uh, uh, books from people. Uh, and, you know, some of them were more important than others, but none were more important than the education trust information. When I finally happened upon, uh, the education trust information. It was really important to me because it was doing something that none of the other information was doing. It was using data and statistics and information to prove the point that kids can learn at high levels. We used to say it all the time in my life and on the on the school board. Uh, kids, all kids can learn at a high level, but we never really had an example to point anywhere. We could never in our district. We really didn't have any schools where we could say, "See, we had a few charter schools here and there that maybe were were breaking ground." But when I got hold of, of the dispelling the myth information, uh, um, Ed Trust used to put out these really long PowerPoints um, <laughs> and they used to make them city or state specific. So I would go reading other people's mail. I'd read the Florida um, one and I'd read the one on another state uh, and bring it back to Minnesota and say, listen, we have to stop living in a silo. Look at this PowerPoint from Florida, for instance, uh, with just the most kind of inarguable finite information in one PowerPoint, you would be able to tell people this is possible. This is what this is what the world could look like. Um, I remember, and this is the last part of the introduction of my Shiro, I'll say, um, is I remember a friend locally telling me, Chris, the environmental movement has messed up by uh, doing the we're all going to die scenario with climate change. <laughs> and she said, what you need to do is tell people this is what a, a tomato is supposed to taste like. <laughs> um, and 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 I never really got it in the beginning when she would say that because I thought she was saying we should just sugarcoat stuff. And she was saying, no, you need to show people what's possible. So my guest, Katie uh, Haycock, uh, is the founder of um, the Education Trust and for years was the, the, the golden warrior of the yeah. Education Trust. The warrior of what I call achievement gospels in the it's being done, it can be done, let's dispel the myth, let's get under the hood, let's look at what successful educators are doing when they successfully educate um, kids and also let's do it with receipts. Let mm -hmm. let me tell you an exact school. This is how I found George Hall Elementary School in Alabama. It's through the work of people like Katie and Katie's team. And, you know, mm -hmm. later I was introduced to other people from the team or who, who were associated uh, with Education Trust who just kind of made it simple and plain. Our kids can learn. And we'll tell you how. Katie, good morning. Thank you so much for hey, that. Chris? You know, here's that long run up to you, <laughs> to you coming on. I think I can um, just, uh, I, I can quit now. So that, <laughs> thank you. No, I really appreciate the work that you um, did over a long period of time because it was so straightforward. Uh, it wasn't a, a bunch of smoke and uh, mirrors, but it, it really was hopeful. It was mm -hmm. like, we can do better. And uh, one of the biggest problems that I have right now is that I really feel like we've fallen into an essentialist belief that uh, if a kid doesn't have two white college educated parents, they're just doomed. Yeah. Um, and, and we talk that way in education, not we, I should say, but many from the establishment do. Yep. Can we go back in the years uh, when you were starting, you had the idea to uh, to form an organization, to build an organization around the idea that it can be done, that kids can learn. What was, what what was your driving factor? What information did you have? And why was it the right time for you to do it then uh, um, uh, to build your organization? Sure. Um, I, I came to Washington in 1989 as the executive vice president of the Children's Defense Fund. 
And um, one of the sort of driving questions uh, during my time there was, could could CDF um, sort of launch itself into what we thought was a kind of second era of advocacy? That is, you got access to, in this case, education or in other cases, healthcare and so on. But now the issue is quality. And the answer to that question for CDF turned out to be no. But but when you sit in Washington, and this was true when I was in California before that, um, looking at Sacramento, and you look at what are the forces that drive education policy at the state and federal level, what you saw is all of the forces were essentially those of the status quo. Um, teachers unions, administrator associations, um, school board associations, essentially those who either worked in or in some ways benefited from the current system as it was. There was no voice for kids, especially poor kids and kids of color. And the need for that, as you sort of watched all this money being allocated, but with no reform edge on it, um, and no drive for better outcomes for the kids who needed that attention, um, the, the need was obvious. And so we set about sort of building a new organization that would make that case. But the, the, the sort of important part of that decision was sort of the question is what's gonna be, what's, what's your main tool here? And it, it seemed clear to us at that point that without data, you're just kind of another guy with an opinion, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we, what we set out to do was to cull through these huge amounts of data that schools and districts and states produce on education, that mo but mostly sits unanalyzed, and try to tell both the story of need um, and that, and that really means being really super honest about the problems, but also provide enough hope and enough direction by identifying exceptions to those patterns um, that would actually energize people and focus them on more effective strategies. So that, that's, that's the ambition. Did you have some examples in mind? Were you doing, you know, school visits or like, you know, did you have some information that made you think we need to dig digger or dig deeper into this? It is always true that when you look underneath averages, there are exceptions. And that is true in a classroom. That is true in a school. That is definitely true in a school district and in a state. So yes, you see these patterns where poor kids in particular are lagging behind other kids or African-Americans behind white kids. Mm -hmm. um, that, that yes, that is true when you look at averages, but underneath that, there are always schools that are doing way better than others that are either improving faster or just knocking it out of the park. We were talking about mm -hmm. George Hall. George Hall in its day, was one of the top performing schools in the entire state of Alabama, mm -hmm, despite mm -hmm. having started as one of the lowest performing schools. Um, and you know the, the school board there had you know, pretty much thought, well, what do you expect, right? The neighborhood right. around it was mostly poor, mostly African-American, lots of single parent families and sort of all the excuses. But when they sent in a new leader who resaffed the school and started in a new direction, what you saw is those kids who nobody thought could learn were actually hitting it out of the park and not mm -hmm. just at the proficient level, actually in the case of that school, at the advanced level on the state assessment. So again, when, when you begin peeling the data back, there are always exceptions, even at the state level. There are states that are improving much faster than others. There are districts where the performance of African-American fourth graders, for example, even low-income African-American fourth graders is two or three grade levels above the same kids in another school district. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to spend much time with the data to see that there are examples that we can learn from. And, you know, the private sector does this too, right? They're mm -hmm. identifying mm -hmm. companies that are earning more, improving faster, and so on. There's resistance there too, I am told, to learning from the leaders. It's usually the kind of middle performers that are aiming at the top as opposed to the low performers that learn from those. 
But we basically decided to use the data both to create outrage at the problems, but also to create energy and hope around the solutions. You know, um, you just use the word resistance. And if you had to ask me about today, I could tell you very clearly who the resistance is and, and why it is. Um, but I can't tell you that about, you know, earlier times mm -hmm. in, in these type of efforts. What, do, what would have been the resistance uh, back then to saying, hey, guys, let's look at great schools. Let's just look at great schools that are doing a great job. There's <laughs> the resistance mostly comes from those who work in the system who don't, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 education often feels to me like, you know, crabs in boiling water, like one starts crawling up and, and the other one's <laughs> pulling back down, right? So instead yeah. of saying, hey, that guy got out of the boiling water by using a particular strategy, we want to pull him back in. Um, and, you know, when there, when there are schools that are unusually high performers, their principals are accused of, you know, there's cheating going on. There's, mm -hmm. they're all, we have mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons for dismissing them because they make us feel like, oh, maybe the problem is us mm -hmm. when it's way more comfortable to believe the problem is the kids. Mm -hmm. So and even then, you would have said, said oh, back absolutely. then, oh, yeah, absolutely. there was there was the blame the kids syndrome even back then. Oh my God, yes, no, we have yeah. we have always blamed kids and families, and you know, frankly, the research establishment with their regression lines have contributed to that. Like mm -hmm. you know, the few pieces of data that you see in in ed school all are about the re regression line. Nobody ever says, let's look underneath the data here. Yeah. and say, whoa, yes, in fact, as the poorer a school is, on average, the lower its performance is. But is that true of all high poverty schools? Answer, absolutely not. But yeah. that's not what they teach you in grad school. Well, here's how, um, you know, how much of a layperson outside activist I was on the board. I can remember the first time seeing a scatter plot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, you know, the most damning thing in statistics is to say, well, you know, the correlation between poverty, race, right, and right, low achievement. Right. And I always used to say, well, you can't argue with correlations. Like, mm. correlation. Wow, yeah. that sounds like a big yeah. word. Wow, yeah, that's true, <laughs> man. God, yeah. You know what's also correlated with high achievement? White skin. So maybe we should just outlaw blackness, right? <laughs> like, you know, we just For get sure. rid of blackness. Everybody sure. will be, you know. Um, For sure. But the moment that I saw a scatter plot, and I had to ask a question and say, well, wait a second. Now, all these schools are poor right. and and uh, all of them have mostly black students. But for some reason, these few are up here and these yeah. other ones are all crowded down here. Yeah. So yeah. now tell me more about those other schools. Tell me about. Yeah. And I remember um, someone in, on staff like thinking, aha, the light just went on in him. He mm -hmm. got it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what they meant to say. They meant to say, if you take all uh let's take all rich schools, all mm -hmm. mostly white schools out of the mm -hmm. data set mm -hmm. and just have schools that have uh, high poverty, high kids, uh, high concentrations, of kids of color. And you look at a scatter plot, some are clearly going to be doing better than the others. Yeah, so absolutely. why not study that? You know, absolutely. that doesn't make any sense. Um, but, what were the, we don't uh, do that. Yeah. We, we just don't. I, I gave a presentation, you know, a couple of years ago to students at Teachers College in Columbia who were at the last, you know, the last semester of their grad school experience there. And as I was talking, I was seeing just anger. And I kept thinking, mm. Mm. You know, I was feeling like it was targeted at me. And I was trying to figure <laughs> out what the hell's going on here. And finally, one of them just exploded and said, why haven't we been taught this stuff in grad school? Why do we have to come down wow. here to Washington and talk to you? You know, and, and two African-American students described their experience of having actually taken in some data from underneath the scatter plot to a class and said to the professor, why don't we talk about exactly the question you asked? Why don't we talk about these schools? And he just shut them down and said, you know, we're not here to talk about the exceptions. We're here mm. to talk about the rule. <laughs> kind of going, oh my I've, Lord. I've heard you mention that before though, that I don't remember how you said it, but that like, let's focus on failure thing, yeah. like the rule <laughs> is is a backwards way of looking at the yeah, world. Totally, totally. Um, if you want more failure, you would study failure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's right. You know, we seem to be pretty good at doing that yeah. without studying it. 
You know, what I think is uh, really interesting about those students that you mentioned in the class who were really upset about it, I felt the mm -hmm. exact same way at some point. Mm -hmm. When I started discovering that we've known all along that we have some great schools yeah. that are really doing a good job, it started making me really angry about the, the drumbeat of, hey, if kids are poor, you've got to lower your expectations. Yeah, right. yeah they can't learn. Um, when you started doing this work and you were building out in the beginning, what were the policy enablers that you learned were going to be important if you really wanted to have the world that you wanted? Um, I, I mean, I think in the end, our conclusion is that it's a, it's a combination of resources and accountability. Um, that, that unless schools are accountable for for the for improving the outcomes for all kids, and in particular for the groups of kids that have been underserved, um, that no matter how much you give them in way of extra resources, things are not going to get better. Um, and you know, some people say, "Well, that's you know, that's all about about sticks." And all I can say is, you know, when you look at the data, sticks work. Um, it's a horrible thing to say, and I wish I wish it were not true. But we make more progress in education when not making progress has consequences for those who work in schools. Um, <laughs> so when you say sticks, what would be a stick? What would be like one that you think actually does is effective and drives achievement? Well, certainly labeling it has been important. You know, yeah, states yeah. that have had more honest uh, and simpler to understand, especially for parents, um, school rating systems, states that make it matter to your rating, not how just the averages look, but how all groups of kids are doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, those kinds of ratings, again, not these complex algorithms that nobody can make sense of, but something that's really honest really drives, uh, drives action. And certainly, I mean, Florida is a very good example of how much sort of parent action was driven by a simple school rating system that had consequences. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when you rate the schools, I imagine that you're you're fine with assessments. Um, Ab absolutely. With, yeah, annual mm -hmm. assessments, student yeah. assessments. Um, where do you come down on things like uh, state standards? I mean, state standards are essential to to the development of, of assessments that actually measure something that's important. So I am definitely a believer that having standard, clear standards and then having assessments that measure whether kids are meeting those or not are essential. It's yeah. not the only measure I want to look at when I'm looking at how a school is doing, but it's a really important measure. And it feels like over time, we've really, um, we've allowed people to attack the instruments rather yep. than the outcomes. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, that's, and that's happening, unfortunately, on both sides of the political yeah. equation, which is, a, which is a problem. But frankly, even if you're skeptical about tests, pretty much every measure that you look at is going to show you very much the same pattern. So people say, well, why don't we use grades instead? Well, there, there are challenges with using grades because you make you make something that subjective a part of your accountability system, um, you know, there, there's going to be temptation to, to screw with it. Yeah. That said, when you look at, if you look at data by race for a school district, for example, you will see very much the same patterns with grade point average that you do with tests. Um, so, and that's true when you look at advanced course enrollments, advanced course completion, high school graduation, college entry, college success. Um, so even non-test-based measures are still showing us we have a problem, but those same measures are also showing us that some folks are solving those problems better than mm -hmm. others. And it's true at the college level as well. We can, we can take a set of colleges that have essentially the same student populations in terms of poverty, race, whatever you want to uh, measure, and then look at their four or five or six year graduation rates, whopping differences, hmm. depending mm -hmm. on what mm -hmm. they do, not the complexion of the kids. And it's that yeah. message. Um, and, and, it, and, and having multiple measures that show, show you um, the problem is useful because it, it means that we if, if you just have a test-based conversation, there are a set of people who just check out. 
Mm. Um, so we've learned over time, you need to broaden those measures, even though tests are fundamentally important to know about the actual learning that goes on. You know, it's funny, you go to the doctor, the, uh, I don't know much yours, but mine, it's just like routine. You take the blood pressure yeah. test yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, before I do anything else. And it's kind of yeah, like, yeah. I never yell at them, <laughs> I'm more than my blood pressure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm so much yeah. more than my br blood yeah. pressure. You know? yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's cute, Chris. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, or you go get a home loan. I'm more than yeah. my credit score. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Chris. That, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, when who who were the champions in the time that you were uh, your work was new and you were mm -hmm. really getting into it? Um, who were the policy champions? Who were the political leaders that you think actually were the example of what we need more of now? Yeah, I mean the the it, it, we had the advantage of working at a time when bipartisanship was was still possible um, and. One of the things that meant is that we needed both Democrats and Republicans who sort of got it, who understood the urgency of change, but who were also willing to work together across uh, across partisan lines to get that done. So when I think about uh, about the the energy that created No Child, I mean that was literally Ted Kennedy, George Miller on the left. George Bush and John Boehner uh, on the right. Um, and there in the end was literally no space between them. There was in the beginning, but not in the end. Um, and it's just kind of a reminder that um, that, that kind of, you, you need people who are courageous enough to, you know, to push their own party but also willing uh, willing to work across the aisle. And that's it's what I worry about right now. It's very hard to find that. It doesn't feel like that is going to be happening again for a while. Not in the short term, I don't think. Um, yeah. I think we got a lot of work to do to rebuild uh, some bridges there, but I, uh, that's a tough one. <clears throat> and we held on to yeah. it longer in education than anything else. Um, but we didn't hold on to it forever. So... Um, so you focus so long on outcomes, student mm -hmm. outcomes, school outcomes, but did you ever fall in love with any particular way of getting to those outcomes? Like, you know, you know, did you develop a secret, secret passion that you never told anybody about for like Montessori <laughs> or, you know, like no excuses, charters, or was there one way, but you never, yeah. you never really said that you preferred one way or another? No, I mean, high quality instruction is always going to be the key to anything we do, right? It's teachers who both believe the kids can achieve and who are willing to respect them in the way that kids respond to. And respect really means challenge. Mm -hmm. High challenge, but high support. Um, so, I mean, somewhere in that nexus is is the key to most of the, the work that we've looked at. And now at the college level, things are a little different. It's really about intentionality. It's about using data constantly. It's about really aggressive mm -hmm. systems of acting on those data to make sure students stay on track. Um, but certainly at the K-12 level, it's largely about instruction. <clears throat> it, it really feels like education has won the war against data. <laughs> uh, like I've, I've argued that like, you know, we've got kind of like a QAnon type of ed movement that is like anti-data, like, oh, our instruction should not be data driven. That takes yeah. all the joy out of education. <laughs> what? And as a person working on the outside, I'm kind of always like, yeah. really? Is that, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like accountants going like, I hate numbers. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, uh, is that like, do you think that that's just like a long um, cynical movement to to resist accountability? Or do you really yeah. believe education? Some educationists believe that you're trying to ruin their system by making it all about numbers and less about kids. No, I mean, there, there are certainly some who believe that. Um, and, you know, it's just like those who continue to believe that teachers should make uh, up every lesson from scratch. I mean, you talk to mm. most teachers and they say, no, please don't make no. me do that. No, yes. Um, no. But but there, there are those who still argue that giving teachers scripted lessons or even fulsome lessons and, um, and asking them to actually teach them 
is a horrible thing to do. So yes, there are always people like that. But I think in general, the the war that's been temporarily won is a war that basically people are not thinking and talking about outcomes a lot now. And even, I mean, you focused a lot of attention, Chris, recently on early reading. And I know mm -hmm, Kate Walsh mm -hmm. has been doing great work on that at NCTM. The learning disability community is spending a lot of energy on that as well. But we're still not making the progress we could make. Um, mm -hmm if teachers got the training and support and materials they needed. And it, it's that our, our unwillingness to take that on is the foundation of so much later failure, right? Um, it, it's just too easy. Um, it's too easy to blame it on the kids after fourth grade if they can't read. Yeah. Um, if they can, and, and their parents in their yeah, home. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's just, it, it's just, um, yeah, this is, it's a problem, and we got to figure out how to regenerate concern about that. I mean, even like, you know, it used to be when the international exam results came in, you know, people here would get a little anxious, like, whoa, look at, look at us, we're 27th in the developed world in mathematics, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But now it's kind of, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> so look, or we're thriving economically no matter what. Um, so how to, how to rebuild a sort of righteous concern about what our young people are prepared to do. I mean, you think a little bit about what's happened with the pandemic economy, very much what happened in 2008. The jobs that disappeared and are not reappearing are the ones that are held largely by students who, or young people who completed high school College. or less. Right. Oh, so yeah, okay. the ones that disappeared and don't reappear. So yeah, yeah, that happened yeah. in 2008. Um, you know, two thirds of the recovery went to college educated workers and that's going to happen again. So so we've got to get some energy behind more, way more energy behind two and through college. Right. This is not mm -hmm. about two and through high school It's about two and through college in this economy. And that means you have to care about fourth grade reading. You have to care about eighth grade math. You have to care about what the coursework that students complete in high school, because that's the single most strong predictor of how well they do in college. So we gotta we gotta help people care about those things once again. And that's where the business community could be a super good partner as they were way back when with us. Uh, yeah. but the you know, it feels like they're more afraid now. You know, they're really, I think most businesses are smart now in that they don't want to wade into anything that isn't feel good, uh, anything that might have a backlash, especially with teachers, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, um, what you, what you just said though, um, um, I'm thinking about these milestones that we all know about, like kids coming to, to kindergarten, uh, ready to learn and prepared, um, mm -hmm. um, having learned some things before they get their third, fourth grade reading, you know, uh, eighth grade algebra mm -hmm. and a certain series of cor coursework beginning in ninth grade that prepares right. you to do something after 12th. Right. right, right. Um, and those all seems like different rooms. Seems mm -hmm. like the people that are captains of each of those milestones, mm -hmm. Uh, exist in different rooms and no one's mm. actually put the puzzle together to say no 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 guys yeah <clears throat> you all have, have to be in the same room you have to like yeah. early early ed uh you know a successful k k1 start with k1 and yeah. and uh third and fourth grade reading eighth grade math uh ninth through twelfth grade prep for life um like that's not one agenda those are multiple agendas mm. And you have politicians who are like, listen, don't make me talk about anything other than early ed. Yeah. Because that that K-12, those K-12 years are rife with all kinds of politics. So yeah. I'm going to be a safe, for instance, Democrat. I'm going to be a safe Democrat and say, we need to make sure every kid gets a great start in life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do think that's a problem. If, if people would coalesce around anything, I wish they would coalesce around high school. Um, because I think we know from experience that demands at the high school level can actually drive change all the way down, mm, but doing mm -hmm. better with youngest children doesn't drive change up. Oh, so wow. if you look yeah. at the data, for example, you see that kids have entered high school over the past 10 or 15 years better prepared than those that preceded them. 
but they've left high school less well prepared. <laughs> so, wow. the, the, so in a high school, when you talk to high school people about students coming in better prepared, they just kind of look at you like, huh? But the truth is the data says they are. Um, so, so I do, I do worry. It's not, it's not that I don't believe in early childhood education. I'm a data freak and I can see the data, but uh, I, if it, if it's all lost in the high schools, then it doesn't do as much good. Mm. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that that um, pressure from colleges and high schools down can drive more change than investments on the early side up. And so we need to figure that out better. Yeah. And it, I, I used to call high school the last exit to Soulville, <laughs> meaning like this is... <laughs> This is your last chance, man. <laughs> this is you get it wrong here, and uh, life is going to look bad for you. So we have a, a comment here from Maureen Kelleher who says, "Question: yeah. What about accountability within schools? Can you talk about how principals build cultures of improvement and trust among adults so people can admit mistakes and improve?" Yeah, um, that's a, a super super good question. Um, one of the things that Karen Chenoweth has done in her work. You know, what, what Karen has done with her research and books is to I, take the schools that are on the, that are getting unusually good results from those, um, from those scatter plots and actually then spend a lot of time with teachers and principals um, and kids and families, frankly, at those schools to try to understand what it is they do. And there, there is no question that the principal uh, principals are always credited as having led that change. Mm -hmm. um, and when you dig underneath and see sort of what that looks like, it's a lot of teaming. So these are principals who by and large, they're not the ones we, we do movies about. They're not the bring a <laughs> bat, right? They're, they're mere yeah. mortals by and large, but what they're amazingly good at is building a community amongst their teachers, creating a sense of ownership using data and data of all sorts. It's not just test data. In fact, test data is probably the least, uh, the least important part of what they do, although important. But they're looking at assignments. They're looking at the work kids are turning in. So what you're seeing is either grade level teams, subject area teams, uh, teachers frequently together, to often using let's let's all teach this unit um the same way together and then let's get together tomorrow and unpack how it went mm -hmm. and let's look at the work kids did in response see what we can learn from that about how to make those lessons ever better so um and that you know it's hard it's hard for teachers to bring their assignments for their peers to look at it's hard for them to share the student work um that came in response to it but in our experience either, in our observation, you know, the, the, the first six weeks of that are painful because teaching and, you know, has historically been a very private act. Um, and making it public, even just with your colleagues is hard. But once you do that and teachers see how they can learn from each other and, you know, how, how one teacher got these way better results by doing it this way, then you really can build um, build an improvement tra trajectory that's just mind-numbingly good. Mm. You know, one of the things that um, we've said on this show before and talked to few few people about is that we have a lot of heat for teachers, but we don't oftentimes talk about principals and um, yeah. and everything that could be said about the prep programs for teachers um, mm -hmm. probably could be said double for yeah. how we produce good principles or don't yeah. produce good principles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's a shame because there's fewer of them. So you should yeah. be able to do a good job of creating great <laughs> principles, right? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't feel like we have that part figured out really. Right, right. Because it's, it's both about picking people who are, you know, likely to, to, to be able to be that kind of principle that I just described. And then about training them. I'm, I mean, I've I've always thought that the, the in the end the best way to do this is by um, identifying our best principles and assigning uh, assigning them roles in preparing the new ones. Right. So so let's learn from the best as opposed to from some ed school someplace. My my own sense is that 
principal preparation is way too important to be left to higher education. <laughs> you know, just period, period. That's a damning thing to say. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> like, I spent a lot of time working with higher ed, so that yeah, comes from experience. Um. You know, that there's a question there for me around, like, as you did the arc of your work as like, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you had a trajectory mm -hmm. um, and it's just natural that you grow some degrees. I've never seen it in you in watching mm -hmm. you for years, any degree of cynicism or even real frustration. But there had to be some, Katie, I mean, oh, like yeah. you're a human being. So, yeah, yeah. like, did you nurse any grudges about things that... <laughs> just stopped making sense to you in the work <laughs> any grudges um and I <laughs> grudges about people but just about maybe yeah. issues that you eventually came to say this is so damn frustrating i can't understand why this is still a thing well ed schools would be high on that list um <laughs> it's, it's, you know, people kept saying why don't you guys ed trust really need to do some work on the ed school side and i'm like no 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 i've watched too many other people who are really really talented try and fail um, no, I think the bigger challenge um, sort of underneath, I think what you're asking, Chris, is how do you avoid not just becoming depressed, right? So there were, mm -hmm. there, there were long periods of time when we were not moving the needle. Um, and in fact, the impetus that led to No Child, like it or not, um, was this long period of time during the 90s when achievement was relatively flat and the gaps between groups of kids were actually getting wider. So after people could kind of lull themselves prior to that into thinking, well, things, you know, they, they may be getting better too slowly, but they're getting better. And then during the 90s, it was just like, oh God. But there, I mean, that's, I suppose, when we really started digging more and more into the exceptions, right? What do you learn from those? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me personally, it, when I'd get kind of into a funk about it, because uh, I, uh, I, I knew my own sense of optimism and hope was important as a communicator, right? If I, if I couldn't both show the horrible data, but also convey a sense of optimism and possibility about fixing those problems, then I was, you know, not doing my job. So for me, it was go to George Hall, go to, you know, Tubman, go to, go to one of these schools that was just hitting it out of the park and sit in classrooms, get excited about what really good teaching looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And that usually, you know, I have to do that, you know, once or twice a year and some, in some years, a few extra times in order to like, just like, okay, I'm ready again. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Did you ever like second guess yourself in the middle of all of that by saying like, you know, the education establishment was telling people how to get it right but they weren't the same revenues oftentimes that you push for. I mean, when uh, the establishment says smaller class sizes, pay teachers more, have more respect for teachers, desegregate the schools, um, which actually was the biggest one. That's the biggest bullet. Like, you know, stop having hyper concentrated poor schools yeah. and poor neighborhoods yeah. or whatnot. Yeah. Were you ever sympathetic to the idea of, hey, man, if we ever really just did that on a big scale, that would eliminate a lot of the problems that we're looking at? Yeah, I, I mean, there are definitely, especially around issues of segregation, integration. I, I mean, at some level, how can you not want more kids to be educated together, right? Um, <laughs> you know, it just all the research, all of experience suggests, you know, that young people are more likely to have cross-racial friendships, you know, work in integrated workplace. There, you know, all the all the stuff that we would like as a country are advanced by integrated schools. But you sat as I did in Oakland when you know I created the organization in California that was sort of Ed Trust like. And at that point we were 90, I don't know, 92 percent African American, Latinos just starting to get a foothold, and you know, a handful of whites. And you're saying, okay, <laughs> if integration is the only way to have high achievement, Mm -hmm. We're stuck, really, right? Mm -hmm. right? We're stuck. And, and what kind of a message does that send? You know, and they say, well, we could integrate. You know, Gary Orfield would say, well, there are all these these uh, regional desegregation possibilities. You could take Piedmont from out of the donut hole of Oakland, and you could 
integrate with those kids, or you could go over the hill to Orinda and Moraga with all the rich white kids, and you're going, and yeah, that's going to happen when, <laughs> for whom, really? Uh, so, I mean, it just seems to me that I am I am glad for people to work on integration. Um, our sense was we don't have time. Right? We, we, while others are working on that, let's acknowledge that there are schools that are educating all black kids or all Latino kids or all poor kids, and they're doing great. So let's yeah. do that while we're working on this. Plus, this is my biggest problem, that, you know. The, if you did orf- that, you'd have easier integration anyway. So if you wanted, right? Well, if the schools were, you know, like, listen, a high performing, we've learned this from HBCUs, a high performing or, or a good value uh, black mm-hmm. school is going to attract mm-hmm. white students at some yeah, point. Yeah, and, you know, white, that has yeah. definitely happened with HBCUs. You know, mm-hmm. Yeah, white people are smart about like uh, locating <laughs> a good value. So, um, so so the ore fields of the world get on my nerves because um, they start with a premise that we can generally a- appreciate and agree with, but because their thing that they've been working on for 20, 30 right. years, in some cases right. hasn't worked right. they have to um they have to attack other reforms to say uh we literally right now in minnesota have a bill that is being uh written and penned in uh, pending that partially comes out of orfield's brother here myron orfield right. yeah. um that will literally penalize high performing um culturally affirming charter schools for not attracting white students so if if they will be they will be put on a three-year plan if they don't attract white students, and if they don't attract white students within that three years, they will lose money. They will literally lose money. Doesn't matter about achievement, doesn't matter how they're doing, whether the kids are happy, whether the parents put them there on purpose, whether the parents are satisfied or whatnot, they will literally lose money if they don't attract white students in three years, within three years. And because we're Minnesota, all the all white schools, though, will be held harmless. It's only targeted at the de- desegregating schools of color, right? What's the rationale for that? Integration is the only way for those kids to learn. Like the government is not fulfilling. Their argument is the government is not fulfilling its constitutional purpose to an equal education if the kids uh, um, are segregated. But segregation in Minnesota and by this law will only mean when kids of color are together. It won't mean when we have entire school districts where almost everybody's white, right? right. So that means like, I can't go in outstate Minnesota and go to a school district and be like, you know what y'all need? Y'all need some Negroes here because y'all ain't got none, right? Like I won't be able to do that, but they will be able to walk into a charter school, a high performing Afrocentric charter school or Latino charter school or Hmong school and say, if you don't get any white students, we're gonna take money from you. Interesting. And does that apply to traditional school districts, uh, high yes. performing predominant? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's going to end up where the only people that get a punishment are going to be schools that serve high populations of yeah. kids of color, not yeah. schools that serve high populations of white kids. Yeah, yeah. So you'll punish one group. And that's where we are with our educational theology now, right? Uh, integration is the one way to make it happen. Now, I went to the same people that we're talking about who are pushing this because I've worked with them in the past on integration mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. and said, are you guys going to touch teaching at all? Teaching mm-hmm. and learning mm-hmm. and uh, any of that stuff, you know, pedagogy, curriculum. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, no, mm-hmm. no, Chris, because integration is the thing that will make it, you know, all better. So I'm only saying that to say we're losing ground, I think, on what I saw as the most powerful focus, uh, which is what you had, what you had is on, let's look at the schools that are doing well with kids and get kids where they need to be. Yeah. Let's stop waiting for magic to happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that focus can come back, right? You You think so? Oh, good. Tell me more. (laughs) No, absolutely. But it needs, it needs strong coalitions to bring it back. Um, And right now we're hampered by the business community being less courageous than it should be. Although uh, maybe we start with a list of CEOs who started on the voting Mm. rights work and shame some of their peers into getting involved in that. Maybe, maybe the next step for them is some shaming around achievement. Um, And the need, I mean, when they look at their workforce possibilities, they have to be concerned. That's true. 
Um, and especially True. those that want a diverse workforce, but high, higher at the high education levels. So, so there's, there's partnerships to be made there. Um, you think, so Katie, you're Californian, you know, at mm -hmm. heart. Um, if you am. think about the Googles, the, the Facebooks of the world or whatnot, um, I can't think of bigger income equality than like, uh, the Palo Alto school district type of area. And, you know, so I think those companies have just taken on, yeah, we'll give some, some pity money to the schools, but we're really going to import talent. Yeah. Yeah. No, some, you some know. people said at one point that we should just stop the H1B visas and, you no. know, if you, yeah. if require people to educate kids here and for those jobs that things might be a little different. Or they might ship those jobs overseas. Is well, what that's, yeah, end up that, doing. that is um, what will scare the policymakers, right? <laughs> well, I want to, um, you did the Katie Haycock thing that I love so much, which is like, well, if we're going to talk about this, let's have some facts on the table, <laughs> um, which I have always appreciated about your, your work. Um, so uh, some of this, I think, gives me hope. I'm, I was looking at some of these data points that you sent over. Um, we have, um, I don't know if, the, if your point here is that we have and uh, a good number of black students and black people that are achieving both in K-12 and, and uh, higher education by the numbers. You know, so when I see something like, you know, almost 11,000 black students and uh, 80,000 Latino students earned a five, which is the top score on the AP exam. Um, are we saying that that's good or are we saying that that's what we start with? Well, it, it, OK, so if you look at percentages, you'd be dismayed. Yeah, but then yeah. there are a whole bunch of people who look at the overall data and don't see that there are exceptions to that. So as you're as we're building a case that says, yes, there are glaring problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Black and Latino kids in particular are are uh, lagging behind where where Asian kids and white kids are. But but don't be confused by that. That doesn't mean they all are. And there are kids every single day who are hitting it out of the park on AP exams, on SAT, on <clears throat> on admission to colleges, and so on. So it's it's again it's about it's about dispelling the myths that are in people's heads about who yeah. can't learn. And I'm afraid in too many people's heads, there's an image that says, yeah, yeah, I know about these gaps. And that that means they're all there. They're not. <clears throat> that actually, I think, is one of my biggest points to take away from a lot of your work is mm -hmm. stop pretending like uh, failure is universal for any group, mm -hmm. any subgroup. There, there are black kids that are knocking out of pop park. Stop ignoring them. Yep. Uh, yep. And they're poor kids. This number on the AP, you mentioned Florida early in the discussion. So mm -hmm. Florida... Um, one of the things I remember from a Jim Bush uh, presentation that you did here in Minnesota was that they um, they had a 300% increase in black students not taking AP exams, but actually passing, passing. them. Yeah. Um, so when you hear that type of growth, you have to ask yourself, okay, 300% increase in the number taking it. Something happened between uh, the, the not passing and the passing, um, and we should all learn from that. Um, you're also saying here that approximately uh, 2,200 black students, uh, almost 5,000 Latino students scored at the top levels of the SAT. The UNCF puts out a lot of information around this, and mm -hmm. their thing is the percentage that actually pass in all four categories, mm -hmm. I think, might be their thing. Um, like the totally college, the ones that graduate uh, ready to, to ace all parts, mm -hmm. like extremely low, like 12% or something mm -hmm. like that, 5%. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the aggregate numbers, it's nice to know that we have a, a population to study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, what's going on sure. with you guys? I want to get down to Kentucky. What are these two yeah. things showing me about Kentucky here? Yeah, what I'm basically trying to show here is what those scatter plots we were talking about earlier look like, right? So this is a um, scatter plot that, that plots um, poverty rate ac across the bottom and achievement on the left um, axis. And what you see, you know, what professors always want you to see is that red line, right? And it says, you know, as the, as the poverty level of the school gets higher, um, the achievement on average goes down. But what the second slide there shows you is if, if you look at the circle on the right there, it shows you that among those high poverty schools, there's a huge range in achievement from those mm -hmm. that are at the very, mm -hmm. very bottom to those that are quite uh, 
quite high achieving. And if you look at the circle at the top, what you're seeing is that at all levels of income uh, distribution, there are schools that are unusually high achieving. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the schools in the kind of intersection of the, box, uh, of the two circles there that Karen would go study, right? So those mm -hmm. are the ones that we can really learn from, suggesting once again that demography is not destiny, that what schools do actually matters. It seems like if you look at these two slides, it's a choice about what, it's about making a choice. What yeah. do you want to believe about yeah. education and the people yeah. that are being educated? I can't think of a good reason to choose the red line, you know, the regression <laughs> line. I can't think of like what it does for you to say, no, right. let's stick by that as the law, yeah. except to say we don't want to hold anybody accountable for what the people are doing in these, in the second. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's, there. you know, it's that's something that Ron Edmonds used to lecture, you know, before we were even around, right? So back in the 60s, the whole effective school thing, he, what he used to say over and over again is, how many schools do I have to show you that serve poor kids or black kids <clears throat> um, effectively for you to believe that it's about, not not about the kids, but about us? And if the answer to that is more than one, that I suggest yeah. there's something wrong with you. And I think he was dead right. <clears throat> so Ron Edmonds, who had the effective schools movement, actually mm -hmm. looked at those schools and said, here's my takeaway on mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what we can learn from them. Um, and I think part of the problem, probably I don't know if you agree with this, that happens is that people go out and try and say, okay, here's the recipe. Here's the yeah. five things that he found. Yeah. And then when they fail to replicate, when, they're, when they fail to be able to make it work, then they say, ah, it must be junk science. Must be the kids. Yeah, must be the kids after must all. Must be the kids. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's and, and you there's there's a lot of human nature that goes there, right? So how do you get up every morning and go to work at a school if you believe that the low low results are your fault, not the kids? Yeah. It's much easier over time to blame it on them. And that's why there need to be these outside voices, whether they're parent voices or others, that say, no, 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 <laughs> look, look, there's a school right here that serves kids just like ours, getting better results. Um, yeah. We can do better. It's not the kids. Um, but unless there's somebody constantly pressing there, um, unless our systems constantly press there, our school district leaders, our state leaders, our uh, activists of all sorts, um, then it's need. just too easy. You need a more, a less fragile workforce is what I think, <laughs> um, you know, because the fragility in the workforce is weird and it's middle class and it's very pampered in a way to me. What we need are tough minded. I, I, yeah. I feel this way just coming out of social services where oftentimes you're working with some of the toughest cases and you're doing case notes every day and you're mm -hmm. not making the type of progress where you're changing the whole world. Mm -hmm. But you've accepted the fact that the part of the job is to um, work with tough scenarios and tough situations yeah. where there's not going to be a perfect answer every mm -hmm. night, mm -hmm. but you don't stop serving your families. Right. Like you keep working with them. If you're a social worker, you don't say, Oh my God, you know, we didn't get everybody out of poverty today. Right. Right. No, you wake up the next day, you do your case notes and you're kind of tough nosed about it. But mm -hmm. um, what's Michigan showing us here? Poverty versus achievement in Michigan. Same, same thing. thing. Same thing. Same right. Thing. I, we yeah. could graph the line, but I'd rather look at the circle and look at those schools at the top and say, OK, where are they? Let's go visit. Let's learn from them. So is that like one of the main strategies of everything that we're talking about and education trust and your theology just in general is to let's look at this. This is where our, this is where um, yep. success is going to, we're going to find success. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But the same thing in the, that next slide there. So what that looks at is the performance of uh, low income African American kids in fourth grade reading. So I know you care a lot about reading, so I picked mm -hmm, reading. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, if you looked at national data, you would see that oh, low income African American kids on average do you know do less well than other students. But if you look just at low income African American kids, and you look across the urban districts that participate in TUDA, what you see are whopping differences in the performance of the same group of kids. Right. So on the left hand side, you wow. see, I can't, I can't yeah. hardly read it's, those numbers. Uh, on the left, right. it's Boston, right? Yeah. Boston and Charlotte, Boston, Charlotte, and Tampa. So the three on the left hand side. And then Cleveland, Fresno, and Detroit on the right. And the difference between those, just mm. in the performance of mm -hmm. poor black kids at fourth grade, is more than two grade levels. 
Wow. So yeah. So so I want to learn from the places that are doing better. And if you, I mean, it's, same thing is true when you look at the um, grade four math. You know, whopping two to three grade level differences, but also differences in this horizontal bar one in improvement. So right there, you're looking at improvement. No oh, shoot. Are you still looking at this one, the change in scale scores by district, low income? And it looks like some of the biggest, is, I want to say that's the district. That yeah, might be some, DC at the top there. Yeah, for some reason, I have lost the video here. Ah. Oh, you can't see us anymore? No, no. Oh. Where, did it, where did it go? Uh, no, 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 no. Well, this is okay. I actually, so, <laughs> so I get... Uh, um, like uh, this one that we're looking at right now, I get this big, big difference between the growth of DC, for instance, and Cleveland. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and on the previous ones, like, you know, if I were, <laughs> I would be saying to myself, I don't want to put my kids in Fresno, but yeah. I might want to put them in Boston. Yeah. Um, but if I were believing that it's that failure is just universal, if you're poor and you're black, it's just going to be universal, I wouldn't be seeing these underlying stories. Correct. Um, and Correct. I would never be able to improve on these underlying stories that doesn't, uh, um, uh, make a lot of sense to me. Correct. Um, I see popped in again. <laughs> yeah. In yeah, yeah. No, I figured out how to get, Oh, now <laughs> I got doubles on you. Oh. <laughs> Two Katie's. Um, oh, um, here we go. There we go. We're back to one, one Katie. Thank God. Good. Um, so this is to me, this is when I talk about the achievement gospels, I don't think that people always understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is actually we need the good news of what's working so that we can keep doing the work to, to progress, to make right. our kids do better. Right. Studying failure, getting lost in the essentialism of like, listen, demography actually is destiny, yep. is cultural suicide. It's actually educational suicide. If if we as black parents and parents of color and people who care about our communities and care about success suck down that message, uh -huh. that literally is Jim Jones Kool-Aid. Yeah. That is like uh, um, the worst message we can drink down. Uh -huh. um, and, and it starts with us. This is why I like your information. You've done a real service to us over time. <clears throat> by saying, if you're going to think that way, Chris, let me give you some information that's going to help you prove your case mm -hmm. and be informed. I can't think of a bigger service to activism, like a bigger service than to say, people are going to tell you you're crazy. They're going to mm -hmm. tell you you don't understand numbers and you don't, you know, I'm not going to mention a person I had a nationally known edu celebrity for years, PhD, who said mm -hmm. to me publicly, Chris, you know very little about education. <laughs> and and especially now, as I go into wow. my four, fourth decade of being a parent, wow. <laughs> a public school parent mm -hmm. uh, with kids still in the pipeline, I thought to myself, um, this is the problem with professionals. Yeah. This is the problem with professionals. They don't know when they're wrong. They don't mm -hmm. know that they're wrong when they're wrong. And they will have you thinking all the wrong stuff about yourself. So um, what I want to say to you in the end of all of this, and I hope we can keep talking, which is just is I've always so appreciated the fact that you were like if if we had a Bible of the 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 achievement gospels there would definitely be a book of Katie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very so, kind of you to say yeah. that. Very kind. <clears throat> um, you know, as we end and as we wrap, you're supposedly retired, mm -hmm. um, which I always say to people because uh, yeah. I think you guys are still doing work. Mm -hmm. um, where are you now? <laughs> You're like, no. <laughs> Where are you now on your assessment of the world? I mean, you came, you saw, you conquered, you did a lot. Um, and you have to be reading some of the news and the tea leaves about where we are now. Um, what, where are you on the hope meter? Where are you on the, like, listen, guys, we should focus. Yeah. Uh, and you're not focusing. Like, what is your analysis of where we are in the moment? Um, I, I am worried. I, I I choose always to see the possibilities as opposed to um, to get you know sort of overwhelmed by cynicism. But I think we got two problems staring us in the face right now. One is um, 
not enough concern about outcomes, even after a lot of kids have been out of school for a year. Um, and that there's not more worry about that um, al alarms me. Um, so, but second, I do worry about uh, the increased polarization in the country, um, in, in our political system. And I, I know that good policy and education is much more likely if you've got bipartisan um, agreement. And so mm -hmm. how to do both of those things, both create a sense of urgency and build back some bridges uh, so that people can actually do what matters, um, it's gonna take some work. Wow. Um, well, I, uh, I guess like, uh, that's for those of us that are carrying on for the next wave mm -hmm. of this reform, that's our job. Our job yeah, is to actually see, is. make all sides of the power dynamic, see what's possible, that's right. uh, and actually work on behalf of kids. Uh, I appreciate you. Please come back again and let's stay in Anytime. touch with each other. Um, Anytime. for those of you all watching, uh, I usually tell people how to reach our guests, but our guest, uh, probably doesn't want you. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine <laughs> with that. Stuff, my so. email, yeah. give my email is fine. All right. Well, Kate. if anybody's interested, I will uh, uh, give you Katie's um, um, connections, uh, yep. how to connect yep. with her. Um, so for those listening and watching, this has been an hour with uh, the, the um, founder and a CEO, former CEO of the Education Trust, Katie Haycock, who has a longstanding track record of showing us what data can tell us about schools that work for kids. If we want a better schools movement, if we want a movement that actually um, shows us what's possible rather than continuously tells us what's not possible, this is where we want to be. This is where we need to be looking for inspiration. And and, uh, and I see people in the comments. Thank you all for listening, for watching, for being here. I see some of you saying, I'm interested or whatever. <laughs> Let's get this achievement okay. gospels going. Let's make this happen, all right. everybody. Well, so, with an advocate like so. you, Chris, it's going to happen. Thank you. I appreciate